Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. İnnel hamdelillah nahmeduhu ve nestaînuhu ve nestağfiruh ve na'ûzu billâhi min şurûri enfusinâ ve seyyi'âti a'mâlinâ. Men yehdihillâhu felâ mudillâ lâh ve men yudlil felâ hâdiyâ lâh. Ve eşhedü en lâ ilâhe illallâhu vehdehu lâ şerîkâ lâh. Ve eşhedü enne Muhammeden abduhu ve rasûluh. Amma ba'd. In this series of lessons then, insha'Allah ta'ala, we will be discussing the fundamentals of Tawheed. Because on the Day of Judgment, the people will be separated and they will be in two groups. A group who enter paradise and a group who enter hellfire. The group who enter paradise, they will be the people of Tawheed. And the group that enter hellfire, they will be the people of Shirk. So it is essential, it is very important for every believer to understand Tawheed and to understand the meaning of it, and to understand shirk, and what the types of it are, in order to avoid all of those different types of shirk. We are going to be reading through a famous book, known as Kitab al-Tawheed, the book of Tawheed. And this particular book, has many different chapters in it, and all of those chapters, they talk about parts of Tawheed and aspects of Shirk, so that when a person goes through all of these chapters one by one, you learn more and more about what Tawheed is, and more and more about what Shirk is so that you can remain upon Tawheed and you can stay away from Shirk. We'll be using mostly the explanation of one of the scholars of our time, Al-Shaykh Salih Al-Fawzan, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, an explanation that is simple and straightforward, an explanation that is simplified, and so we can all benefit and understand, insha'Allah ta'ala. He mentions in the introduction, the introduction to this topic of Tawheed, فَإِنَّ التَّوْحِيدُ هُوَ الْأَصْلُ فِي بَنِي آدم. This is the first thing to note. That Tawheed, that is the origin of mankind. Allah created us all upon Tawheed. Not like what some of the people say, that Allah created mankind and initially, originally, mankind didn't know what Tawheed is and what anything is. And then they had to examine and analyze until they then worked out what Tawheed is. Rather, Allah created mankind upon Tawheed from the beginning, from Adam alayhi salam onwards. وَالشِّرْكُ طَارِئُ And as for shirk, then that is something which occurred, which happened afterwards. Originally, Allah created all of this mankind, Bani Adam, from Adam alayhi salam. Originally, they were upon Tawheed. That was the origin of mankind. Then later on, shirk entered into the affair. Shirk then began to enter in 
and began to manifest itself and people began to fall into it. But originally, mankind was created upon Tawheed. As Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma said, Kana bayna Adam wa Nuh Asharata qurun kulluhum ala tawheed. In the narration of Ibn Abbas, radiyallahu anhuma, he said, between Adam, alayhi salam, and Nuh, alayhi salam, there were ten generations of people, and all of them were upon Tawheed. So Allah created Adam, alayhi salam, upon Tawheed, and then the next Next generation after Adam alayhi salam and the next generation after that one and the next generation after that one for 10 generations which is approximately a thousand years that is what is meant that is the normal understanding of the Qur'un of the generations when these narrations speak about it so from the time of Adam alayhi salam, the first person, up to Nuh alayhi salam, there were ten generations, approximately a thousand years worth of time, and all of those people, generation after generation, were upon Tawheed, as Ibn Abbas mentioned in this narration. كَانَ بَيْنَ آدَمْ وَنُوحِ عَشْرَةَ قُرُونَ كُلَّهُمْ عَلَى التَّوْحِيدِ Between Adam and Nuh were ten generations, all of them were upon Tawheed. وَأَوَّلُ مَا حَدَثَ الشِّرْكِ فِي الْأَرْضِ فِي قَوْمِ نُوحِ So then, after ten generations of mankind, being upon Tawheed, it was then at the time of Nuh alayhi salam, the first messenger, Nuh alayhi salam, his generation of people or thereabouts, that's when the first shirk slowly started to appear. Before that, it was generations and generations and years and years of Tawheed. Then at the time of Nuh alayhi salam, approximately a thousand years after Adam alayhi salam, that's when the shirk first began to appear. And that is because of the creation the people had in regards to the righteous amongst them. The story is well known that at the time of Nuh alayhi salam or just prior to him, there were righteous people, righteous people, and everybody loved them, and everybody respected them, and honored them, and looked up to them. And when those righteous people died, all of the society, they were left in a lot of grief and sorrow and sadness at the loss of these righteous people. And so Shaitan took that opportunity. He saw that the people were in this emotional state having lost these righteous people from their community and that everybody was very sad and emotional. So the shaitan took that opportunity. He did not say to them straight away, commit shirk. That was not going to be possible. For 10 generations, their forefathers and forefathers they were all upon Tawheed. This generation wasn't suddenly, overnight, going to start committing shirk. 
So shaitan did not instantly say to them, commit shirk. Rather, when he saw their emotional state, he saw that they were very sad because the righteous people had died. He made a plan step by step to make them commit shirk. So at first, he said to them, those righteous people, those great pious people that you are so sad about, you've lost them, you should go to their graves so that you remember them. Because by remembering them, it will make you stronger in your iman. You will remember how righteous and pious those people used to be. And that will help you to increase in your own, own iman, in your own iman. So the people, they thought that's a good idea. So they began going to the graves of those righteous people. Then the shaitan said to them, but wait, when you go to their graves, don't just go and come back. When you go, stay there for a long time. Think and ponder over the lives of those righteous people. Don't just go and come back. So the people, they thought, yes, that's true. We should stay there for a while. Think carefully about these righteous people. Ponder over their lives, how pious they were. And maybe that will help us. So they began going there and sitting at the graves for a long time. Then the shaitan took the next step. And he said to them, Instead of you having to go out to the graves to remember those righteous and pious people, instead of you having to go out there to the graveyard all the time, why not just make some, some pictures or representations of them, some types of pictures or figures that you can put in your homes and in your community centers and in your villages, so that whenever you see those pictures or representations, you'll remember those pious people. You'll remember how righteous they were, how pious they were. And by seeing that and remembering, it will help you. So the people thought, yes, that's a good idea too. So they made these pictures or figurines or representations of those righteous people and put them in and around their residences and their communities, still, they were not committing shirk yet. But then it was after that, that the shaitan then said to them, instead of just these pictures and things, make proper statues of them. Make proper idols representing them. So the people did that. Still, they did not worship them. When those people died, that generation of people died. And as Ibn Abbas mentions in the narration, Halaka Ula'ika, those people they passed away and they died. And knowledge was forgotten. And the next generation came, the next people came. And those idols were now there that their fathers had made. Their fathers had made those idols of those righteous people to remember them. And those idols were there still. But this new generation of youngsters, of new people, they didn't know what these idols were or why their fathers had built them. So then the shaitan came to them and said, the reason why your forefathers had built these idols is because they used to worship them. When there was a drought, they used to make dua to them. They used to call upon them. So this new generation of people didn't know any better. And so they believed those whisperings and they began calling upon the idols supplicating to the idols, seeking from the idols, they began doing it. Look at the method the shaitan used, step by step by step, 
until he finally managed to cause Bani Adam to fall into shirk. That was the beginning of shirk occurring in this ummah. That was the beginning of shirk entering into this ummah. And when that occurred, it is mentioned, of course, that shirk then continued throughout history. Throughout history from that point onwards, shirk continued in the different people and the different generations. And so Allah sent the prophets and the messengers reminding the people to come back to their origin that they were created upon and the purpose and reason they were created for, why Allah had made them and put them on this earth. And that was for the purpose of worshipping Allah alone. But still, many continued upon the shirk. And we know that at the time of Nuh alayhi salam, the great floods occurred. When the kuffar were destroyed, the disbelievers by the floods that happened at the time of Nuh alayhi salam, Noah. And of course, Nuh alayhi salam and the believers were saved in the ark, in the ship. But all the disbelievers were drowned, buried under the water. And the idols that they had made were also taken away by the flood waters. And they were buried under the ground when the flood waters receded, when the water finished and the land became apparent again, the floods went away in the end. Those idols ended up being buried underground under the floods when the floods were there. And they ended up getting buried near what is today known as Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. And then a Sheikh al Fawzan mentions that years and years and years later, at the time near to the time of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, there was an individual by the name of Amr. Ibn Luhay al Khaza'i, and this individual, he was influenced by what he had seen from the idol worship in the different lands. And it is mentioned how the shaitan whispered to him to go to those beaches of Jeddah and to dig up, and he did. And he found those original idols from the time of Nuh alayhi salam. And so he brought them back into the Arabian Peninsula, into the land of Hijaz, into the areas of Mecca. He brought them back and they began to be worshipped again by the mushrikun who were there at that time. As Shaykh al-Fawzan, he mentioned, Look at how when shirk begins, how it can continue and continue and continue. Those idols, they were made at the time of the first messenger, Nuh, alayhi salam. And they carried on being worshipped up until the final messenger, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were dug up and worshipped again. When shirk takes a hold, then it is very difficult to break sometimes. So that is the history of how shirk initially began in this ummah. So the first point to note there, the first point to note there, is that the origin of mankind, what mankind was originally created upon was Tawheed. Then shirk appeared and occurred later on, generations later, at the time of Nuh 
alayhi salam or there or thereabouts. Now then, when it comes to this aqidah, when it comes to this tawheed, there are a few more introductions we need to learn today before starting with the first section of the book. And from those introductions is what a Sheikh al Fawzan mentions here. فَإِنَّ عَقِيدَةَ التَّوْحِيدِ هِيَ أَسَاسُ الدِّينِ this aqidah regarding Tawheed, it is the basis of our religion. And that's important to remember. Because many Muslims out there, many people out there, when they give da'wah, when they do classes, when they do their lectures and their conferences, they give no importance to Tawheed whatsoever. They want to talk about the rulers and they want to talk about politics and they want to talk about world affairs and all different things. And they do not give importance to Tawheed. But here notice what the Sheikh says. Tawheed is the basis of our religion. Tawheed is the basis, the origin, the bottom line, the fundamental from where all of this religion is built upon. وَكُلُّ الْأَوَامِرْ وَالنَّوَاهِ وَالْعِبَادَاتُ وَالطَّاعَاتُ كُلُّهَا مُؤَسَّسَةً عَلَىٰ عَقِيدَةِ التَّوْحِيدِ All of your actions and your deeds and your interactions, everything in the religion of Islam is built upon Tawheed. And that is why when you look at the five pillars of Islam, what is the first pillar? Shahadatu an la ilaha illallah. The testimony that there is none deserving of worship in truth except Allah. La ilaha illallah, meaning tawheed. That's the basis. Then comes the prayer and the zakat and the fasting and the Hajj and all of those other affairs afterwards. So Tawheed is the basis of the religion. And that's why it's so important for every believer to understand it properly and to understand the details of it. And then the Shaykh mentions, وَلِهَذَا كَانَ اهْتِمَامُ الْعُلَمَاءِ and that's why scholars give so much importance to Tawheed. That's why scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, the Salafi scholars, they give a great deal of importance to Tawheed, a great deal of importance to understanding this affair. And they have written so many books about Tawheed, clarified all the matters about Tawheed. Everybody must understand this is the core of the religion. It is the basis upon which the two groups are going to be split up on the Day of Judgment. One group into paradise, the people who practice Tawheed. And the other group in hellfire, the people who abandoned Tawheed and they practiced shirk. So that's why it is important to understand this with clarity. And you will notice in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Whenever he used to give da'wah, he would begin with the da'wah about Tawheed. Whenever he used to send his companions to go to other countries and other places to give da'wah, to tell people about Islam, he would tell his companions, when you go there, begin with Tawheed first. That was from the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling them begin with Tawheed first 
then other things, prayer, zakat, hajj, they come after the establishment of the basis, tawheed. What we need to understand in this introduction also is the three basic categories of tawheed. When we talk about tawheed then, we need to understand what we mean by tawheed. And the Shaykh Al-Fawzan, Hafizullah Ta'ala, explains that at the beginning. So when we talk about Tawheed, what is Tawheed? The word Tawheed, it comes from an Arabic word, Wahada Yuwahidu, which means to make something single and unique. To make something single and unique. One, single, unique. No other participants or partners. One and alone and single and unique. That's the meaning of the word Tawheed. So then the question is, how do you make this Tawheed? How do you make something single and unique and one? The answer to that is with Two things. So remember these two things. The first of them is known as affirmation. Affirmation. If but. The second one is known as nafi, which is negation. Remember those two words affirmation and negation. Affirmation, it means that you establish something, you accept something, you affirm something to be in existence. For example, as a Sheikh al mentioned, imagine now there is a room And there are four people inside of that room. If I tell you that three people in that room, or rather, if I tell you that one person in that room is standing up, I have now given you affirmation. I have given you affirmation. Meaning I've told you there is one person definitely standing up. I've given you that information. It exists. One person is standing up. The negation is the second part needed. Because if I just say to you now, there are four people in the room and one of them is standing up. I've proven to you, affirmed that one person is standing up. What are the other three doing? Maybe they are sitting down. Maybe they are standing up too. We don't know. So right now, we don't have Tawheed. We have not made this one person single and unique as the only person standing up. I need to give you the second thing, the negation. I need to tell you that the other three are not standing up. So now I've given you affirmation that one is standing up. And I have given you negation that the other three are not standing up. Now you have to heed, because now you know there is only one person standing up in that room, and the other three are sitting down. You need affirmation and negation 
to make Tawheed. Imagine if I just said to you, there are four people in that room, one of them is standing up. And then I ask you the question, so how many people are standing up in the room? You cannot just say for definite there's only one. Because all I told you was there is one person standing up. What are the other three doing? Are they standing up too? Or are they sitting down? We don't know. I didn't give you any negation. Maybe they are standing up too. So we don't have Tawheed yet. We cannot say there's only one person standing up for definite. I need to give you the second part of the statement. The negation. I need to tell you that the other three are not standing up. Now you know there's definitely only one standing up because I've given you affirmation that one is standing up and I've given you negation that the other three are not standing up. Put those two things together and you have to read. You now know only one person is standing up in that room. This is how Tawheed works. To make something one and unique, you need to give affirmation about it, and you need to give negation about the rest. That's why we say, La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah. So I've given you an affirmation. That Allah is deserving of worship in truth. But I've given you a negation too that all of the others are not deserving of worship in truth. So now we know only Allah is deserving of worship in truth. That's Tawheed. Affirmation and negation. So now we understand the meaning of the word Tawheed, to make something single and one and unique. And to do that, you have to have this affirmation and negation. In La ilaha illallah, there is no deity worthy of worship, no God worthy of worship in truth. That's a negation. Illallah, except Allah. Allah is deserving of worship in truth. That's an affirmation. When you put them together, then you have the affirmation and the negation. You have to heed. There is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah, who is deserving of worship in truth. That's how you make the tawheed. Remember that very carefully. Because what you will notice in this book is that the evidences about Tawheed, they are all about affirmation and negation. You will see this thing about affirmation and negation in all of the book, in all of the evidences. So now we briefly understand Tawheed. The next thing to understand is what types of Tawheed are there? And there are three main types of Tawheed to understand. Three categories of Tawheed to understand. And this is the easiest way to remember it. One type, as the Sheikh mentions here, the first type is known as, in Arabic, Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. And in English, that is known as the Tawheed of Lordship. And that basically means that you will make Allah single and unique in His actions. We know there are certain things that Allah does that only Allah does and nobody else. For example, creating death and life, giving us life, creating us, then we die and then 
resurrection, this life and death, only Allah can give us that. Only Allah does that. So we affirm that Allah gives life and death. And we negate that anyone else gives life and death. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, the Lordship of Allah. Another example, the rain that falls and the fruits that grow and the greenery and the vegetation that you eat. Who sends down that rain and makes this growth happen? Only Allah. So we affirm that Allah alone sends the rain and the provisions and these fruits and the vegetables, they grow, this rizq, it comes for us, this sustenance, this food and drink, and only Allah sends that for us, and we negate that anybody else can send that for us. So heed one and unique. Affirm that Allah sends these provisions, this food and drink, and rain and growth, and negate anybody else can do that. Another example, the control of all of this universe. Who controls all of this universe? We affirm that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls all of this universe and we negate that anybody else has any control in this universe. To read affirmation negation, affirm that only Allah does this action of controlling the universe and deciding on what happens in the universe. And we negate, refuse and reject that anybody else has any share in controlling this universe. Those kinds of things are known as the Tawheed al-Rububiyya, the actions of Allah, that we affirm these specific actions, only Allah can do them. And we negate that anybody else can do them. That is known as the Tawheed of Ar-Rububiyyah. Very simply, to make one and unique and to single out Allah with his actions, with the things that only Allah can do and nobody else does. Tawheed on that. The second type of Tawheed to remember, as the Sheikh mentions here, is Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. It is known as in Arabic, Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. In English, that is known as the Tawheed of worship. The Tawheed of worship, meaning that we make Allah one and single and unique in terms of our worship to him that we affirm all of our worship to Allah and we negate it from anybody else. We affirm our worship to Allah and we do all of our worship sincerely for Allah alone and we negate our worship to anybody else. We do not do our worship to anyone else besides Allah. That is Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, the Tawheed regarding our actions. Remember, Tawheed al-Rububiyyah was the Tawheed regarding Allah's actions. This Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah is the Tawheed of worship, of our actions, that we make our actions singled out and unique and only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We affirm them to Allah, we negate them from all others. We do not worship anyone else besides Allah, not even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is known as the Tawheed of al-Uluhiyya. 
from those two categories so far, throughout history, people did not really have an issue or a problem with the first type. Tawheed al rububiyyah they did not really have a problem with that. They agreed Allah is the creator alone, he is the provider, he is the one who gives us the rizq, the provisions, the food, the life, the death, and controls the universe. They believed and accepted that. The problem throughout history and the reason why the people, they fought against their prophets and messengers was because of that second type of tawheed that we've just mentioned, the tawheed of al-uluhiyyah, of worship. Because people did not want to worship Allah alone. They did not want to affirm their worship to Allah alone. They wanted to affirm it to Allah, but they didn't negate it from others. And remember, we said you can only do tawheed when you affirm it to Allah and negate it from others. They affirmed their worship to Allah to a degree, but they did not negate it from others. So they may have worshipped Allah, but at the same time, they were worshipping others besides Allah. So they were committing shirk when it came to Tawheed al uluhiyyah One other thing we can briefly mention, what is the connection between those two types of Tawheed? Those two types that we've mentioned so far, what is the connection between them? The connection is that if you understand Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, the Lordship of Allah properly, then that will necessitate from you to believe and accept Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. That is because if you believe only Allah is the creator, nobody else, only Allah is the one who provides for you, nobody else, only Allah is the one who gives you life and death, no one else, only Allah created this universe and controls all of this universe, no one else. If you believe in all of those things and do tawheed, in regards to all of those things, the rububiyyah, then surely you can only worship Allah alone. It necessitates that you must worship Allah alone. Otherwise, how can you say that you believe only Allah is the creator, only Allah is the provider, only Allah is the one who gives life and death, only Allah is the one who controls the universe, but you're going to go and worship something else who doesn't do any of those things? That doesn't make any sense. If you believe in a rububiyyah properly, then you must then believe and act upon al-uluhiyyah and worship Allah alone. How can you worship others who you know are not the creators of this universe? You know they did not give life and death. You know they do not control anything. That's why Ar-Rububiyyah, the Tawheed of Allah's Lordship, necessitates from you that you should believe in an Uluhiyyah. And if you look at it the other way around, Tawheed Al-Uluhiyyah, if you believe that you should single out your worship, every type of it to Allah alone, and negate it from all others, then that indicates you must have accepted a rububiyyah Why does a person single out his worship to Allah alone purely and sincerely and negate it from all others besides Allah because he understands a rububiyyah and that's why al uluhiyyah includes a rububiyyah within it a tadammun as they call it in Arabic al uluhiyyah it incorporates, includes a rububiyyah If you believe in an uluhiyya, then surely you have believed in a rububiyya 
So think about those carefully, those categories of Tawheed. Repeat this lecture afterwards. Revise that section and listen carefully to the aspects of those Tawheed parts. The third and final aspect, the third and final category we'll briefly just mention is known as the Tawheed of the names and attributes of Allah. In Arabic, known as Tawheed al-Asma'i wa sifat The names and attributes of Allah. We know that Allah has many names. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Ghafur, many names. And Allah has many attributes, many descriptions. All of those we believe are particular and specific to Allah as is deserving of his majesty and that nobody in creation is comparable to Allah whatsoever. We cannot be like Allah. We are not similar to Allah at all. Nothing in creation. We affirm the beautiful and great and tremendous names and attributes to Allah. And we negate them from others besides Allah. The mushrikun didn't do that. The people who committed shirk, they would take the names of Allah and give those names to their idols. But we believe in the Tawheed in regards to the names and the attributes of Allah also. And we'll touch upon all of those categories throughout this book. But in particular, we will be discussing in detail category number two. Al-Uluhiyyah. Because you remember we said the biggest problem all of the prophets and messengers faced from their enemies was regarding an uluhiyah. People did not want to worship Allah alone and they continued, carried on doing different types of shirk. So that there today gives you an overview of Tawheed. That is basically a general look at what Tawheed is, very briefly. Next week, insha'Allah ta'ala, we will begin with the first section of the book, the book Kitab al-Tawheed. And for those who are maybe uh, a little more advanced as well, and you wish to follow along with a particular text, then you can get the explanation of a Shaykh al-Fawzan. There is a summarized version of that available in English as well. So you can try and get a hold of that. It will help you with your studies, help you with understanding all of the chapters. And inshallah ta'ala, every week we'll do a chapter from the book because the book is made up of lots of chapters and they are short chapters. So every week we'll look at one particular chapter and we'll break down the evidences in that chapter, what it means, and how it explains Tawheed further, and how it explains the wrongs of shirk further. So insha'Allah ta'ala, that's where we'll conclude today. And we'll resume with the next section from next week. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.